Clinical neuroscience is showing humans to be way more complex than, than simply just their brain, although of course the brain is very, very important. But brains don't think, people think. How do you get from brain processes to what it's like to be you? Welcome to Purposeful Lab, a Maja Center podcast. I'm Catherine Hadro with my co-host, Dr. Dan Keebler. Okay, episode three, we've we've talked about the brain, the evolution of the brain. We've talked about, you know, psychology and you the know, development of the brain and how adolescence. Brain develops, yeah. Exactly. Today we're gonna be talking about the mind and where does the mind come from? And we really couldn't be joined by a better guest, Dr. Sharon Derricks. She her background is she was a neuroscientist, a brain imaging expert. Now her focus is on Christian apologetics. She's an adjunct lecturer at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. She has a doctorate in brain imaging from the University of Cambridge and has held research positions at the University of Oxford, UK, and the Medical College of Wisconsin here in the U.S., but grateful to speak with her from across the pond. She, she's the author of a few books, including the book that's most relevant for these purposes, Am I Just My Brain? Yeah, that, that title, Am I Just My Brain, sums up sort of the the million dollar question about, you know, consciousness. How do we explain the the rich conscious experience that we have, mm-hmm. um, our mind, our feeling, uh, our, our, our perception that we have uh, free will, that we can do what we want, we can deliberate about our actions, uh, that other people have free will. Um, and uh, how do we juxtapose that with this idea that the brain is a physical organ that we can describe and, right. and follows physical laws? So, uh, are we just our brain or is there something more? Is there an immaterial aspect uh, to us? Can we be reduced to the brain? And that we'll get into that that question yeah. with her. Can the brain explain everything that's going on here? Well, I'm interested to hear what she has to say. So here's our conversation with Dr. Derek. Dr. Sharon Derrick, we're so grateful that you're joining us from across the pond. Thank you so much. First off, do you mind walking us through your background as a neuroscientist and letting us know what you're up to today. Absolutely. And it's a pleasure to be here. So I, um, I actually started my journey in science uh, studying biochemistry. Uh, that was my undergraduate uh, degree subject, which I loved. Um, and I loved discovering what was happening uh, in, in uh in a sense, at, at a microscopic level. Um, but I uh, wasn't too interested in uh, the research involved in that um, and wanted to study kind of larger systems. And somehow that that led me into um, neuroscience and brain imaging. Um, uh, and, and actually, um, you know, this whole technique of MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which is a means of looking inside of the human body uh, without cutting into it because it's able to harness the body's um, natural kind of water and construct a 3D image of of the human body. Um, And then, of course, functional MRI, being able to look at brain function when it's engaged in different uh, mental tasks. Um, This fascinated me. Um, I discovered it Actually, while I was still an undergraduate, um, some friends along the corridor were studying MRI for their third year physics project. And, and, and I began to kind of find ways to kind of look into this and, and study this technique myself, um, which, um, yeah, led me uh, via an internship in the pharmaceutical industry in, in Switzerland to um, a PhD in Cambridge at a, at a an imaging lab uh, on the Addenbrooke's hospital site as part of the University of Cambridge. So that was um, kind of how I came to be uh, in that field. Um, And I ended up, I don't know if I ended up studying um, initially some of the methodology involved in um, neuroimaging. It was at a time when this technique was really still um, really being trying to be understood by scientists. What was it measuring? How could we improve the kind of parameters to get the best signal out of the MRI scanner and and so on? So my PhD was quite methodological. It was involved in, you know, tweaking various parameters and seeing the impact that it had. Um, 
And then I went from there to do a postdoc uh, actually in, in the US at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And there I was looking at um, something quite different, um, human cocaine abuse. Um, this is an ethically approved study by the US government and um, looking at the impact that um, cocaine had on, on the human brain. Um, and that was fascinating and a, a massive privilege to be involved in. Um, and then I came back to the UK and, and did some more research after my study in apologetics. And um, yeah, so that that's a little bit of my journey. I, I don't know how it sounds to someone on the outside. It might sound a bit a bit odd, but it's been it's been quite an adventure. It's fascinating. Yeah, that's great. So you know your your background as a as a, as a neuroscientist. Uh, you know, this is sort of what we've been looking at this season on the podcast is uh, you know, looking at the, the human brain, the evolution of the brain and behavior and how the brain develops and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, particularly in the scientific community, people think, oh, well, we can image the brain. Uh, so we know, you know, uh, we, that allows us to understand human behavior. So if we can show what regions of the brain are active, that can tell us, oh, we know exactly we can reduce behavior down to just neurons firing in the brain. Um, and, uh, you know, then that, that leaves us with this, this question, what is the mind, right? Mm. What, what is this, this conscious experience I'm having? How does that relate? Um, is that something you think that neuroscience can ever get a grip on that, that question of what the mind is or, uh, are its tools not, not uh, appropriate for that? How, how does that, uh, you know, in your, mm. your view, um, the limits of yeah. neuroscience or what can it do, you know? Yeah, well, great question. And I, I guess as we get into the whole conversation around whether we are just our brains, as a lot of people think we are. Um, and of course, I, I wrote a book with precisely that title, exactly. Am I Just My Brain? Um, we, one of the responses that we give is that we, are, we don't just have a brain, we also have a mind. Um, and of course, how you define the mind depends on the view that you have. Um, I mean, the, a definition that I used in my book was from the Oxford English Dictionary, which says that the mind is the seat of awareness, thought, volition, feeling, and memory. In other words, you know, in addition to our brain with all of its neurons and synapses and chemicals and physical processes, we also have a mind with all of its thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories and so on. And so, uh, we have this inner reality, which we can certainly define in terms of what we think it is. Um, but uh, in terms of whether the scientific method can access it, well, that's a whole other question. And it's part of the um, response that I give to to this question that, yes, you can measure what's going on in your brain perfectly well, but in order to know what's going in your, on in your mind, measuring stuff in your brain doesn't reveal that to us. You, you are the only one that can reveal to another person what's going on in your mind. And so some people would argue that the sciences are not able to access the mind in the same way that we can access, you know, chemical processes in the brain. It's a different phenomenon. And I think this sets us up nicely for this exact conversation we'll be having with you. Can you just continue to expand on what is what would be called the materialist's approach to understanding the mind and this idea that really, you know, uh, the brain and the mind are the same thing? Yeah, I mean, so the, the important thing to say is that there are lots of different positions out there. Um, and what I did in Am um, I Just My Brain was try and summarize the field um, and condense it into a few understandable positions. And I think for a lot of people, this subject can seem very inaccessible and I tried to make it accessible. So I think that a materialist might would take one of two views. Um, one, uh, the, the first one being that Essentially, the mind is the brain, which is to say that there isn't, yeah, that mental states are brain states, um, mental processes are brain processes, um, which kind of means 
that there really isn't anything it is like to be you. There's just brain activity. Um, and this is not a view that every materialist would hold, but it is a view that some materialists hold. And they would say that really um, all of your thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories are coming from your brain. Um, in, in a sense, you are your brain, uh, your thoughts, your behaviors, your decisions, your personality. It's all driven by uh, processes inside of your skull. Um, which is another way of saying really that um, there isn't such a thing as the mind. Mental states are brain states. Mental processes are brain processes, which when you really boil it down and take that view to its logical conclusion, it's essentially saying that there isn't something that it is like to be you. There's just your brain. Um, but of course, that has some very significant implications. Um, at a logical level, it's, it's incoherent. The person expressing their the view is saying that my first person perspective on the world is that there is no first person perspective. There isn't a self. And you can't really even express that without reference to some sort of self. So it's logically incoherent. And of course, we don't live as though that is the case. You know, we, we, um, we treat people's kind of speech and views and opinions as if they are coming from them, not from forces beyond their control. If it's coming from forces beyond your control, then what are we to do with that information? What does it even mean if it's not coming from you as a person? And of course, where I land in the book is that we don't live as though this is the case. Logically, it doesn't make sense. And also clinical neuroscience is showing humans to be way more complex than, than simply just their brain. Although, of course, the brain is very, very important. But brains don't think, people think using their brains. And so there's lots that we could say. There's another materialist position, um, which is that, um, that the brain um, creates the mind, you know, the brain generates the mind. Um, but there are also problems with that that we might want to come to later because mm -hmm. you still have to get around the problem of how do you get from brain processes to what it's like to be you. Um, even if you put the word create in there or generate, that doesn't get you around what David Chalmers refers to as the hard problem. How on earth do non-conscious neurons generate conscious human beings? The that this is not um, straightforward, it's not easy, it's not a foregone conclusion. And so there are all kinds of problems, even with that view, which is seen as a more moderate materialist position, it still runs up against the same problems that the view uh, of, of mental states being synonymous yeah. with brain states. Yeah, I think that the, 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 the experiential argument, I think, is one of the strongest ones, that nobody actually behaves as if... <laughs> They are just a pack of neurons. And, and, and we've evolved in a sense to try to understand other people's minds. Like we, we want to, we look at people, we try to draw out what's in their mind. We don't try to draw out yes. how are they working as an algorithm. <laughs> you know, it's a, we, we want right. that we're drawn to that. We really, and, and the reason that we have these conversations is because we, we want to get to the truth. We want to see what, what's the wisdom you have in your mind and, 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 and learn from that and, and other minds that we, we want to get to something. That, that's true. And, and, and it, nobody acts as if they aren't um, sort of in control of their, their, their actions in a sense, in, in a certain sense. We all know that, you know, from brain imaging that our actions aren't always free, that they're sort of reflection of things and, and so forth. But at the end of the day, when we deliberate about something, we really um, uh, feel that we have, you know, uh, this, this control over our actions that we're thinking, we're processing them. And, uh, you know, to, to deny that seems to deny that we are very uh, existence, it seems, uh, it, it seems to me. And there are people that just deny that, that we have that. Um, you know, Daniel Dennett being one who just says, well, it's just an illusion. But it's, 
you, you, you had to explain why we have that illusion. Of, you know, it's very. Well, the, rare, the if problem I, is if 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 actually it's illusory, then how do we know that Dennett's own opinion isn't a product of that same illusion? So right. it becomes impossible to say anything meaningful about anything, <laughs> um, and any reference to the I or the self means nothing. And I think there's a role here for. You know, and I actually don't mention this in my book, but there's a role here for intuition. We have a sense yeah. that we exist and we live as though we do. And mm -hmm. there's actually a whole kind of globe full of people that are of that viewpoint. And do our do our intuitions tell us anything about reality? Do they lead us to truth? And I think I think we need to what what I'm trying to do in my approach to this subject is take take what is said in, in philosophy and in the lecture theatre seriously, but also take it out of that arena into reality and look at how do we actually live, what do human beings do in the clinic as well, and look at a holistic view of human beings and try and reach conclusions about human identity, yeah. taking all of that into account. That being said, now that you know we've heard these different arguments from what a materialist might think of what the mind-body relationship is. Can you walk us through your response and, again, your years of studying the brain? What is your take on the mind-body relationship? Yeah, thank you. Um, so initially, um, uh, I think I, I set out to pr propose one particular viewpoint that I thought was was going to kind of solve the solution, but uh, solve the the question of am I just my brain? What I ended up doing was saying, you know, there are actually lots of other ways of describing human beings than simply chalking it all down to the chemicals inside of their head. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I've put forward the the view um, already that um, non-reductive physicalism or emergentism that the brain creates the mind. That's one of the views that I propose as an alternative. The challenge being that people that hold that view still have to solve how non-conscious neurons generate the conscious mind. But of course, if if God exists, then um, we didn't just start with physical neurons. We started with a conscious mind. And so there are a number of Christian theists that solved the problem uh, but through the existence of God uh, with that particular view. Two other viewpoints that I have found helpful. One is um, substance dualism, one that says that we don't just have a physical brain, we also have a non-physical mind. And these two things work very closely together, but they are distinct entities. And therefore, non-physical, the non-physical mind can bring about changes in the physical brain and, and vice versa. Um, and of course, the challenge that substance dualists have to resolve is how on earth does a non-physical mind influence the physical brain? And how do we marry that with the sciences that seem to show these two things as seeming to look at the same thing and being so so integrated? So that's another view. And then another uh, position that is growing in popularity is panpsychism, which comes from the Greek pan meaning all and suke meaning soul, and essentially is saying, look, let's not start with physical building blocks to try and explain the mind. Why don't we make human the human mind primary and fundamental and build a case from there? And this view basically says everything has uh, possesses consciousness. In, in, in effect, there is kind of mind uh, infused throughout the universe and in, throughout physical things. And so there are levels of consciousness, yes, in humans and in every living thing and even down to the atomic scale. Um, and that's a fascinating view and it certainly puts back on the table the centrality and the importance of human consciousness, that we can't deny this most central facet of what it means to be human. Um, um, but it, it tries to explain it. Um, and, and it's a really helpful view, but the challenge that people holding this view need to resolve is, how do you explain the very different levels of consciousness that human beings have, even compared with the most advanced primates? Um, so every view has its challenges, um, but 
one of the things I wanted to say is there are lots of ways of thinking about the mind-brain relationship. It's not simply that we we have to, you know, accept that neurons explain everything. Um, so yeah. that those were some of the approaches that I took in my book. Yeah, it seems like no matter what approach you take, you get down to that fundamental hard problem consciousness that you know, right. That there is never. Uh, <laughs> How do you how do you um, relate something that's clearly non physical? Something that uh, I can only experience my you know uh, my consciousness. You can experience yours, but I can't hand you all, uh, a pound of my consciousness or or something. But uh, how do we reduce that to in um, to the material world? So even like in panpsychism, there isn't an obvious you know just say well it just is you know it's sort of rather we don't have to explain it just really it's there it doesn't. Um, you yeah. know, it's a fundamental property of of, of, of existence. Yes. So all of these, you know, trying to go back and forth between the brain and and, and consciousness, there doesn't seem to be an obvious route to to, to do that. There's a, there's a mystery there, I think, at the heart of, of 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 the human person. And I just wanted to get your take on you. You mentioned briefly that you know, so neuroscience, modern neuroscience, is showing sort of how behavior is more than just the brain, or there is, it's limited. You know what it what it shows that that it's more complex than than what we might originally have, uh, have thought. You know what are your what is your take on sort of what 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 neuroscience is opening up to us? Because often you get the idea, oh, neuroscience has shown that oh, when you think of God, this area of your brain is lit up, so we can explain God. You know, right? So so you get that sort of uh, yeah. um, you know very uh, trite you know arguments about. Uh, uh, reduction in yeah. this. Uh, what what would you say would be a more accurate understanding of where we are? Yeah, great question. And and um, I think that w- what the neuroscience is showing is that clearly mind and brain are connected. You know, my time spent in brain imaging. If you put someone in an MRI scanner and you give them a mental task that uses their mind, for example, their working memory, you know, memorize these numbers as they appear on the screen and then retell them to yourself a minute later, what you see is networks in their brain light up, corresponding to the use of their mind. Clearly, mind and brain are connected, and there is no doubt about this. Um, and but but just because they're connected does not necessarily mean they are identical or synonymous, or that one overrules and overpowers the other. Um, and this is a an error that is being made. All the time, um, and of course, you know, crossing the boundary between what empirical science can tell us and what is an, uh, a philosophical position that we are holding and bringing to the data is something that happens all the time as well. And and I guess in the area of you know what's happening in the brain during religious experience or when we pray, um, of course, there are networks in the brain that are uh, active when people are praying. And actually, uh, you know, Christians believe that we are physical and spiritual beings. So that is actually exactly what we would expect. We're integrated physical and spiritual beings. Um, And the presence of activity in the brain doesn't negate the genuineness of the experience itself of what is actually happening. we didn't get to talking about it earlier. I probably should have mentioned it earlier, but philosophers talk about this thing called qualia. Um, and qualia are, if if you like, qualitative experiences that are impossible to describe physically. One, one being, you know, like, for example, the smell of coffee. If we were to try and describe the smell of coffee, but all you have at your disposal are physical descriptions you can't actually get to the smell itself. You, uh, f- um, you know, the chemical structure of caffeine or the physiology of it as you digest it are brilliant and elegant scientific descriptions, but they don't get you to the smell itself. And, and they use this to make the point that actually life is full of qualia and the biggest qualia of all being the experience of what it is to be you can't be captured in physical descriptions. And similarly, with religious experience, the experience itself is very distinct to the networks in the brain that are active. And just because you have brain activity does not negate the validity of the the, the experience itself. Just like uh, in a romantic love, there are all kinds of studies that are um, conducted to see what's happening in the brain during the process of someone being in love. And 
And of course, we see all kinds of reward networks to be active. And none of that is used as evidence to undermine the genuineness of the fact that that person is experiencing a romantic affection towards another human being. Of course, that's extremely valid and it's happening in parallel to what's happening in their brain. And of course, we wouldn't use it to question the validity of the relationship itself. The relationship and its existence is the reason why there's activity in the brain. And the same goes for religious experience and what's happening when we pray. Mm. This is simply telling you what's happening in your brain while somebody is connecting with the divine. It, it doesn't undermine the divine. Uh, it's a reflection that we're integrated mm. physical and spiritual beings. And so cr Christians and people of faith don't need to be afraid of this kind of data. Um, we should be more concerned if there's nothing happening in our brains yeah, right. when we're praying and engaged in this kind of thing. And speaking of that integration, can you speak to how changes to the body do affect mental function? Yeah, I mean, I think we see this interaction between mind and brain working so closely all the time. Um, you know, there's the... Um, you know, there, there are obviously things in terms of like healthy uh, fetal development. You know, you see that as the, the human brain develops, then levels of consciousness and the development of, of the mind and its capabilities happens in parallel with the development of, of their brain. And we also see that outside uh, uh, after birth, you know, in the development of children and so on. But then we also see it when, when disease and, and damage come. To, to the brain, uh, brain injury or brain degeneration, that there is a, a parallel thing happening in, in the mind uh, as, as the brain de um, degenerates, you know, mental, um, memory and personality are, are affected. And so, you know, changes in the brain do affect um, the mind. Mm. Of course, one of the points, though, that I make in my book and when I speak about this is that that is generally the case, but it also isn't the whole story. There are instances where what is happening in, in the mind doesn't seem to match up, actually, with, with what you see uh, in the brain. Uh, I can say more about that maybe later mm. in our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, obviously, in general, when we look at clinical medicine, um, brain brain states and mental states do seem to work in parallel. There does seem to be a close correlation, but there are, there are some exceptions to to that rule. Um, and then, of course, similarly, uh, the mind can affect the brain, and this is another reason why you are more than just your brain, because the mind is powerful in its impact on the body and brain. It's something that scientists and philosophers refer to as downward causation, mm. even just at the most basic level of all of the kind of self-help books that say, change your mind and you change your life. Mm. You know, there's something in that. That's the thing that, um, that actually the mind yeah. has a powerful effect on the body and yeah. brain. We see it in the placebo effect. We see it in psychosomatic illness. We see it in, um, you know, sports psychology, that ma sports matches are lost and what not simply on the physical ability of the person, but on what's going on in their mind while they're playing as well. Um, there's so much we could say about the mind-brain interaction. It seems that both can affect the other. Right. It's not yeah. one-way right. traffic. It's actually a very dynamic relationship. Yeah, that, that's great. We talked about like how habit formation, like well, I'm going to do this and you decide I'm going to do this over and over again, makes it easier to, and changes. You see physical changes in the brain can be associated with, yeah. the, you know, and those, uh, you know, so this, this two-way street um, is, 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 is very, very uh, true. I think one of the things that, you, know, you hear often um, uh, is that, oh, well, if we, you know, th that our free will, you know, is, is, is limited or doesn't exist because we can show, oh, well, you know, the brain has fired in this pattern um, and that's why you have this conscious experience. Because there is a correlation between, you know, certain, you know, uh, psychological damage or not being, you know, um, getting attention when you're younger that affects then your behavior later on. So everything is just determined by your past e experiences, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so you know, as... You know, so there is a certain aspect of this causation where the way the brain is structured affects our behavior. But 
you also have this other direction that that, that you're not limited yeah. by that, right? Um, and, and is that yeah. is that what you? How would you respond to people that because that, that argument that we don't have free will is really you know it's it's a very strong. Uh, argument in the culture of, of neuroscience, yeah. I think, yeah. where they say, well, we can explain Absolutely. why everything you do based upon, you know, what your brain state is at this time based on your past experiences. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that I would, I definitely am of the view, I'm not um, going to deny that there are levels of determinism in, in our makeup, you know, uh, at the very basic level, we're determined by the genes from our parents. And there are personality traits and as well as our, you know, physical appearance. And um, there are all kinds of things that are to some extent determined um, by things that are beyond us and, and beyond our control. But does that mean that we have no ability to bring about meaningful change in the world at all? I think that's a very different question. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, the answer that you give to am I just my brain impacts whether you believe that to be true. Of course, if we are, I mean, I had a conversation just last week with a, a student that believed that they were entirely determined by forces beyond their control and therefore they had no free will. Mm. And I said to them, then what does your question even mean to me? <laughs> and because it's not coming from you, it's coming from forces beyond your control. It's not right. being held by you. And he said, yeah, that's what I believe. And I said, but we're not living as though that's the case because we're actually having a conversation because the appropriate response to your question, if, if there's no free will, is to ignore it and to continue on or to just simply do nothing. But we're living as though it's coming from you and I'm responding to you and so on. We don't live as though there's no self. We don't right. live as though everything yeah. we think, even thoughts, like everything you think, that's not coming from you, that's coming from forces beyond your control. We don't live as though that is the case. We award grades to uh, high school students on the basis that they learned the information and they performed in the exam and they deserve the grade, good or bad. We reward bravery in war. We punish crime. We have law courts that do that precisely on the basis that the person was the bearer of their actions, however determined they may be by certain factors in their background and upbringing. But there's still a, a sense that they could choose and they had alternatives in that moment and therefore can be held morally responsible. You see, there are huge implications for justice, for legal decisions yeah. Yeah. Um, around moral responsibility if there's no free will. And we don't live as though that is the case. And so I think there's a lot of problems with with that view. I don't think the neuroscience necessitates that we hold that view either. Well, and the fact that we have that brain plasticity and have the ability to rewire our brain until the day we die, I think speaks to how we can change our habits and change our behavior. And we're not determined by that. One thing I've heard, Sharon, you know, people say is, you know, the brain is like the hardware and the mind is the software. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of that comparison? You know, we need analogies and we need things that we can get a hold of because these can be quite abstract things for people. Um, and particularly if someone wouldn't necessarily count themselves to be a you know philosopher that's spending a lot of their time thinking about this or a neuroscientist or whatever. And so whatever analogies we can come up with that help people to grasp kind of what's going on is helpful. And to some extent, the software hardware illustration is helpful. Of course, every analogy breaks down. It doesn't have its, mm -hmm. it's not a full, a full kind of explanation. I'm not an IT specialist. I'm married to one, thankfully. And so I don't really understand um, whether hardware and software fully interact with each other. I think that they seem to just operate in parallel, um, that the hardware sustains the software. I don't know that software can bring about changes in the electronics. Right, yeah. I don't think electronics can ultimately generate software programs, you know. Right. So I think. It's helpful in, in it helps us understand the different categories, but it has its limits as well. You know, one thing I'd be curious to get your thoughts on again as we're talking about the mind and brain, 
um, we hear sometimes these stories of near-death experiences um, in our culture. What does that speak to? You know, what does that, in your opinion, reveal about the mind? Yeah, I think this is one of the examples in in the clinic that I um, have been thinking about. That you know, if they're true, they in, they perhaps indicate that we are more than just our brains. I mean, the the concept of the near death experience has been around since the seventies. Uh, so the sort of fifty years of um, data and um, story that have been um, gathered and, and collected and, and actually studied fairly systematically by some cardiologists and neuro- neurologists um, and psychiatrists um, with studies in the UK, the Netherlands, the USA. And it, I guess what it is, is an instance of, if you like, uh, a kind of um, uh, a religious kind of aspect to something happening in a clinical context. So it's sort of the intersection of these two kinds of conversation and and of course what we're seeing i mean is uh people upon resuscitation uh who have been in a state of reversible clinical death mm-hmm. have reported being conscious during that time of being um clinically dead with no detectable brain signal and, and no heart mm-hmm. signal and have reported, um, you know, and, and over the years, the features of a near-death experience seem to be kind of quite common, have commonalities between people. And th- this is fascinating. Um, and, you know, I think if you are just your brain, this kind of data set makes no sense. It, it seems seems strange. And, of course, a materialist would say, it's ultimately there must still be some activity in the brain that is giving rise to this. Um, and we need to take that seriously. But one thing that we can say is that, you know, uh, there's something about the the lucidity and the vividness of these experiences that people report and some of the things that they report that can be corroborated don't seem to be indicative of a brain in shutdown. You know, if these are the last moments, the last bits of activity in a dying brain, and yet here they are seeing whole landscapes and meeting um, deceased relatives that they didn't necessarily know had even died or um, or even existed in one case. Um, and extraordinary things that they could never have known um, in the natural. Uh, how do we explain that for a brain in in shutdown? There seems to be a disproportionality there. Um, however, I guess if God exists, if there's a non-physical realm in addition to a physical realm, then we at least have a framework uh, for making sense of near-death experiences. Not that we have all of the answers, and it doesn't answer. You know, there are still lots of questions around this, but we do have a framework because. Uh, if God exists, we believe there's a non-physical realm, a spiritual realm as well as a physical realm, and so, and we also believe that that death isn't the end of the physical body, that death isn't the end of the person, mm-hmm. uh, and so there is there is a framework for for making sense of near death experiences. I think they're fascinating, uh, and I think I want to think about them a bit more. Yeah, yeah, they are interesting. I think at the very least, like you said, they 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 put in question how how well do we understand the connection between the brain and the mental activity, and that that alone just yeah. gives us a a pause for humility and 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 to step back and rather than say we have all the answers here because it doesn't make sense from right. really any uh, sort of perspective that we sort of outline. So it's a very fascinating. Yeah, and well, along those yeah. lines, Sharon, if that's right, I'd like to you know. Maybe hear some more of your personal story. You've shared that you're a Christian apologist today, but my understanding is you were previously agnostic. Uh, do you mind walking us through your journey a bit um, and how your time as a neuroscientist eventually led you to God? Yeah. Um, yes. I. Um, so I grew up uh, kind of not really um, in, in a very loving but sort of religiously neutral home where questions about faith uh, were, not, were just not part of our, our daily 
life. Um, and that wasn't kind of good or bad. It just was the way the way that it was. And um, I um, actually one of my uh, moments that I remember from my childhood was having a an awareness of my own consciousness. I I was sort of sat by a window looking out at the rain and a bit bored, and suddenly had a series of questions come to mind. Why can I think? Why do I exist? Why am I a living, breathing, conscious being? Um, I suddenly was thinking about my own existence and those questions seemed to come from nowhere. They just bubbled up to the surface and um, and then that was it for a few years. And uh, I, yeah, essentially arrived at university. Well, I knew that I loved the sciences from my teenage years and I I went to, to university and I arrived there as an agnostic. Uh, at, at A level at high school, my teacher, my A level biology teacher, had given me a book by Richard Dawkins called The Selfish Gene. And I um, essentially kind of, you know, just absorbed this view that we're material beings and mm. our ultimate purpose is in kind of our genetic kind of usefulness um, and in passing that on. To future generations, um, and I essentially um, absorbed this view and arrived at university, assuming that God didn't exist and that you couldn't um, be a scientist and believe in God at the same time. Um, and I actually, in the in the very first few days of of being at uh, university went to an event called Gorilla Christian where there were four Christians in a row and you could ask any question that you wanted. And I I actually put my hand up about halfway through the evening and asked my own question, surely you can't believe in God and be a, a credible scientist at the same time. And and actually I was given the answer, well, yes, you can. And that, um, asking someone to choose between uh, God and science, it's a bit like asking someone to choose between um, the processes and programs underlying uh, Facebook or Instagram and the in existence of Mark Zuck Zuckerberg or Kevin Systrom. Um, yeah. and, and actually, we think about that uh, for a moment and realize that those two things can perfectly well exist together. In fact, together, they give you a more complete understanding of Facebook or Instagram. Um, and trying to understand Instagram just by means of the processes and programs leaves you with only a partial understanding. You need to actually speak to the CEO, the founder, um, in order to fully understand it. And so that was really helpful to me. That um, opened up a whole horizon of asking more questions and grilling more Christians. And it was actually about halfway through my time studying biochemistry that I came to realize that it made sense to me, um, the evidence around the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, that actually the reason why there was an empty tomb, there were a set of people that were really convinced that they'd seen the, the risen uh, Jesus Christ. And so I, I, I looked into all of that and became persuaded that it was believable. And yeah, changed my views um, at the age of 20. Um, so that that's kind of how I, I came to faith. I then continued and uh, moved into the area of neuroscience uh, and did my PhD after that. Um, so that that was kind of, yeah, the process involved in that. Yeah, I love that answer, the Zuckerberg uh, and Same. Facebook uh, analogy there. That works pretty pretty well for the uh, God and, and the universe, you know. Um, you you you've been at you know at, at Cambridge and 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 doing apologetic work at Oxford, being at these large you know uh, prestigious universities. You know there, there's always a sense of oh there's this conflict between science and faith. The more educated you get, what has been your experience at at these places in terms of uh, a person of faith who's uh, been uh, in, involved in science? Do you see this? Do you mm -hmm. get uh, a lot of sort of pushback or what, what's the dialogue like that you've been able to engage with? With other people, particularly those that disagree with you know your position at these places. Yeah, I think I mean I'm I'm not working for the university, but I think that Oxford is a, a wonderful place for the exchange of ideas, um, and there are many opportunities to engage in healthy debate and conversation, uh, where for the time being different views are welcome at the table. And I hope that that will be upheld. 
Um, and alongside, of course, many people that think science and faith are in conflict, are uh, there are many scientists who believe in God and are actually at the forefront of their fields uh, in, 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 in the scientific realm. I was just on a panel at the weekend with um, somebody who uh, has a you know an, a royal award from 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 the royal family for their services to science, looking at black holes and uh, the night sky and and so on. And and there are actually many um, uh, formidable people like Professor John Lennox, who is emeritus professor of mathematics at Oxford University, who debated Richard Dawkins in two thousand and six. And many people say actually he won that debate uh, on the basis of highly credible argument. And you've got someone like Alistair McGrath, um, again, Emeritus Professor of Science and Religion for 10 years at Oxford University, um, who also has uh, engaged uh, Richard Dawkins and, and other eminent thinkers and um and of course, very much holds the view that, that science and religion have a mutually enriching relationship with each other. Um, and um, there are many people historically who held these two things together. Right. Um, eminent scientists like, um, you know, Johannes Kepler, uh, Isaac Newton, um, uh, Boyle of Boyle's Law. Um, and so this is actually, if you look back in the annals of history, you see many people who who actually were theists, who believed in God, and it was actually their belief in God that drove forward and inspired their science, mm. precisely on the basis that there's order in nature um, because there's an orderer behind it. And if there's if God exists, we should expect to find principles and and laws and theories that we can actually study and make sense of. That makes actually way more sense than if if God doesn't exist. It's all random and it's all subject to kind of, you know, it's the the basis for order in nature and indeed order in the human mind is much more questionable um, if, if God doesn't exist. Um, yeah. So yeah. there's so much we could say about that. <laughs> But there are many eminent people in Oxford who who are God fearers and who engage in in healthy debate on yeah. this question. Yeah, it's interesting that faith in 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 science that people have it really makes more sense if you have this faith that there's an order and an intelligibility, and that my intelligibility can understand that. Um, and that's why you know the, this myth of science and religion conflict really is that. And I think most credible historians of science, in particular, over the last 30, 40 years, have just sort of put. Put that to bed in academia, but it still persists out there in the popular imagination, unfortunately. So, yeah, it does. Yeah, and I think, I mean, where I kind of land in in my thinking, and the question that I had as a child that I didn't even ask yeah. to be asking, why can I think, is a really good question. You know, when all is said and done, whatever you think the mind brain relationship is, why can we think in the first place? And this is a question that that science can't answer and was never intended to answer. And we need to step beyond the scientific method in order to find answers to it. And if God doesn't exist, then you have to try and explain the conscious mind from a universe of non-conscious matter and non-conscious neurons. But if God does exist, we didn't start simply with non-conscious matter. We've lived in a conscious universe all along. You know, the verse for, first verse of Genesis says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So before there was anything physical, there was mind in a conscious community of Father and Son and Holy Spirit, which is what Christians refer to as the Trinity. And so we have a way of solving the hard problem we didn't start with matter. We started with a conscious being, and humans are made in the image of this God, in His kind of reflection with His imprints. And so, why can we think? We can think because God thinks, mm. because God is a thinker, and it's good and right that we think because we're made in in the image of a thinking God as well. I think just to kind of close it out, and you've already shared so much beautiful reflection there. But can you speak to how? your research on the brain has led you closer to God? And in fact, what more have you learned about God because of your research and because of science? I, you know, 
I think that that my day to day as a uh, when I when I had just come to faith, still as a biochemistry student, I was really um, kind of in awe of the fact that I was studying parts of the natural world that were yet to be discovered. Um, it was actually a while ago, and it was at the time when the Human Genome Project was just getting going, um, when we didn't really know how long it was going to take, and there was just so much more to understand. And I, I remember thinking, wow, God knows about that already, and it's our privilege and our joy to study it and to discover it. Um, I remember being really kind of bowled over by that, and the fact that I could do that and also be in a friendship with the maker of it all himself. That that sort of blew my mind um, and was a whole new dimension on what it meant to be a scientist. And as I moved into neuroscience with that Christian faith, it was, um, again, just wonderful to continue to study the world that, that God has made. If I'm honest, I learned more about what it means to trust God um, when the data didn't always come uh, that doesn't always come when you want it to. And it was kind of a bit last minute for me. And there were some relational tensions in my PhD. There's a gritty reality to these things as well. It's not this beautiful, serene kind of study That's of true, the natural world. <laughs> um, so for me, my PhD and my early years in neuroscience were more about trusting this God that I had come to put my faith in. Um and it's just, it was just a privilege to, to, in, to work with people, to study the natural world, to use technology that was emerging and that was changing the world. Um, yeah, that, I guess that's, that's what I would say. But a, a privilege for us to have you on uh, the, the program. We thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, uh, hopefully we can have you back on at some other time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. I've loved being here. She has a fascinating personal journey, of course, but her professional journey as well, I thought, brought so much insight to what we're discussing this season on consciousness. Yeah, and she has this unity of science and, and faith, yep. having a science background while doing Christian apologetics. Mm -hmm. I think one thing I really appreciated about her um, uh, discussion um, was that her honesty about this hard problem of consciousness, no matter what view you take, there's, there's these still an open question of how does this relate, right, from the materialist view to this uh, uh, view that the consciousness emerges from the brain, the, 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 there's still that hard problem that, that uh, we, we don't fully understand and we need to have some humility about, you know, jumping to conclusions about this. But one of the things that she did say that I, I think is worth reiterating is the idea that, you know, we bring philosophical and theological assumptions to our, our science. And, uh, you know, usually people think, oh, if you have some belief in God, that's going to corrupt your science. But actually, you know, having a belief in a creator that's brought mm -hmm. order to the universe actually resonates and um, is a, uh, helps you understand the science better mm -hmm. than, than the opposite view, um, that yeah. it's just randomness and, and, and chance. And I think a lot of people think the exact opposite. They, they believe right. in God's going to right. corrupt your view of science when in fact, no, it, 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 it really puts it on a more solid foundation, actually. Brings that proper framing and lens and everyone regardless whether or not they know it has some kind of philosophy right. and some kind of bias something. that they're yeah. carrying with them but uh, you know again you set us up in episode one talking about how it's you humans are unique in that we want to know what is on someone's mind and right. so to delve into more what is the mind where does it come from uh really interesting and i think we're going to have more philosophical questions the next few episodes, especially, that we'll be able to get into. Yeah, yeah the next few episodes will be bringing in, uh, you know, philosophers to talk about, you know, what what is the human person, what is the soul, what is consciousness, and um, you know, because as she pointed out, a lot of these questions get very, you know, they the, the science can't only go can only go so far, and it opens up these philosophical questions. So we have to still there to think about it in a rational, reasonable way, but mm -hmm. the science can't answer those. Yeah. Well, speaking of questions and answers, that takes us now to the office hour segment of the show. So some questions for you. This is actually significant news in the science world, um, if I'm understanding this right, because the FDA recently approved groundbreaking CRISPR gene editing uh, therapy for sickle cell disease specifically. Um, 
you, I mean, you are an expert in cell biology. Can you explain what is CRISPR gene editing? And anytime I hear about gene editing, um, my ears always perk up and I always wonder, okay, are there any bioethical concerns here? Yeah, with CRISPR, is it just a technology that um, uh, it allows us to do very precise genetic um, editing, so, so to, to fix uh, small genetic problems within cells in a very um, uh, cost-effective and, and time-effective manner, right? So if there's a defect in a gene in a cell, it's you can, using the CRISPR technology, can cut out that defect and replace it with the proper sequence, right? Mm. Um, and obviously, there's ethical issues if you're using these on human embryos, for example. But in this case, this is uh, they're taking cells from an adult person, um, blood stem cells. Um, they have a defective uh, gene in them. They fix that with the CRISPR technology and then take the cells uh, that are fixed and put them back into the person, the person's own cells. So now they have cells that are able to produce um, you know, the hemoglobin, the, the produce proper red blood cells um, and hopefully wow. um, cure the sickle cell. So it's a great uh, you know, uh, uh, advance. You know, it's, it's, uh, and I think there's other um, things that this, this technology will be able to do to fix and, and help people with certain genetic disorders. Wow. That's, a, that's really exciting. So this is yeah. good news yes, like all definitely. around. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question. Again, AI and the future of AI technology continues to be a major topic of conversation. Still lots of buzz, especially on the impact of AI on specific fields. I'm curious, how do you see AI um, impacting scientific research in particular? Could it, is it going to be a huge asset? Are there some concerns there? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, there, it's going to be a huge asset. I think there's obviously concerns about, you know, um, how you use the, the data and the, and, and, and the information you get from an AI system. Mm -hmm. But particularly in biology, and we're talking today to our guest about neuroimaging, yeah. so you get all this data, you can get huge amounts of data from different people about their images of the brain in different conditions. But how do you process this data and find patterns mm. in that, right? So AI is really good at taking lots of data and finding patterns to that. And so, you know, in biology right now, we're in the era of what's called big data. We have like, you know, lots of genetic spreadsheets data. And spreadsheets. Of data. Exactly. Whether it's neuroimaging data, um, uh, genetic data. And so you have these big mounds of data and sorting through and seeing patterns and connections. Mm. Um, AI is really good at that. So getting the AI tools to be able to extract, sort of find these patterns in these big data sets that we're getting, um, I think is really going to be helpful in advancing uh, medicine. But, you know, AI, you know, you, you, what the patterns it extracts, you've got to then have humans look through those and make sure we're not missing something and look through the AI. You know, the, the ethical implications, treatments, and so forth that, that come out. So it's not like AI push a button and it tells you what we need to do yeah. or it answers the question, but it's going to be very helpful, giving us an idea of how to approach a lot of, uh, of problems and, and make sense of all the data we're getting. That makes sense. Not to replace anyone, but to use it as a tool to sift through all the data that is out there. Right. And, and yeah. Ultimately. And you still need human reason and uh, judgment, human judgment to, to, to figure out and, and judge what AI is pulling out. Can't teach AI that okay. yet, exactly. at least. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for answering those questions. And again, just a reminder for our listeners and viewers, you can send in a question as well and hear it right here on the podcast. Email us at info at com. You can also leave us a voicemail with your question for Dr. Dan Keebler to answer at 949-257-2436. And again, make sure to go to MajaCenter.com to get up to speed with the latest on the podcast, see the latest episodes, and make sure to subscribe on your favorite platform as well. That does it for this episode. We'll see you next week.